Well, good afternoon, church. Thank you for gathering with us here today to uh, come and open God's Word. Uh, I want to invite you to turn with me to Acts chapter 21 now, where we're going to be uh, reconsidering uh, for a final time what we've been looking at over the past couple of weeks. And uh, if you've been with us over the past couple of weeks, you remember the the grand theme of this passage is that Paul was called uh, by the Spirit of God to go into Jerusalem uh, as he has been convicted by the Spirit to bring the offering to Jerusalem. And we really looked at it from under the idea of how we as Christians can respond to the Christian convictions that we have received through the Spirit of God imparting them to us. And so as we come to this today, you might say, well, why are we returning to a passage which we seemingly concluded from just this past week? Well, for this reason, there is a sub-theme in this passage which the Lord has just used to speak to me so powerfully, I cannot pass it up. And so if you will, please turn with me to Acts chapter 21. We're going to reread what we've been looking at these past couple of weeks. Acts chapter 21, verse 1 to verse 16. And really, what this sub-theme is, is something you're going to see hit at every single stop of Paul's as he's making his way to Jerusalem to bring the money to the Jerusalem saints from the Gentile churches. And it is this theme. It is that Christ has torn down every single wall of hostility that not only exists between us and God, but also between us and our brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a powerful message to be able to uh, inspire us uh, to forgive one another and to draw close to one another no matter what may have been done in the past because Christ has torn down every single wall of hostility which has existed between us uh, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so turn with me again, Acts chapter 21. We'll read all 16 verses uh, so that we can see this truth on display. It says, And when we had parted from them and set sail, we came to a straight course to Cos, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. And having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had come in the sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload its cargo. And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days, and through the Spirit they were telling Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. When our days there were ended, we departed and went on our journey, and they all, with wives and children, accompanied us until we were outside the city. And kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship, and they returned home." When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemaeus, and we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, and coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, Let the will of the Lord be done. After those days, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. And some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us bringing us to the house of Nason of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we should lodge. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we get to come and and look at this passage once again, that we get to plunge into the depths of the just glorious truths from your word, Lord, knowing that that there is uh, never a passage which we can uh, truly exhaust. And so, Lord, we just thank you that we are able to return here once again to a familiar passage to many of us, but also to a passage which hopefully will in, in, inspire us with some new truth from your word, which, which you have shown to us and which you will show to us uh, uh, in this relationship that is had between Paul and the brothers uh, and the sisters in the churches he visits all throughout his journey back to Jerusalem. God, may you guide us to this truth. Lord, may you uh, lead us through this truth to break down any barriers that we may have uh, placed up uh, between us and a brother or sister in the Lord Jesus Christ in order that our fellowship might be altogether sweeter and also, and more importantly, that our fellowship would display the mercy which you have given to us in that you tore down the barrier of hostility which existed between us and you, God, through the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Now, barriers have proven to be a necessary tactic to be able to enforce some boundaries which need to exist between individuals who may be concerned about some hostility that may come about between them uh, fellowshipping with one another. 
Barriers have been used in examples of our homes. We have doors on our homes so that we would be able to prevent someone from coming in. We don't know who these people are. Uh, We certainly don't know what they uh, are wanting to do, and so therefore we have our doors with locks in order that we would be able to guard ourselves against the possible hostility that may come about from someone we don't know. Still also you have kingdoms which have erected barriers over the centuries in order that they would be able to protect their kingdoms from becoming conquered by other kingdoms. The Great Wall of China, even today there is a wall which exists between Bangladesh and India which is 2,000 miles long in order to prevent the crossover from the Bangladesh and, and India borders so that they would be able to protect themselves and their kingdom. Also one that we're probably most familiar with is the Berlin Wall, uh, which was a concrete barrier which was erected that encircled the West Berlin of the Federal Republic of Germany from 1961 to 1989, which separated it from East Berlin and the German Democratic Republic. We remember the great tearing down of that wall because that wall no longer became necessary. And this is true. There are times in which barriers are necessary to be erected in order that we would be able to prevent some sort of hostility from taking place between us and an individual that we do not know or may not have yet come to trust. But when we do come to trust them or when we do uh, have that barrier of hostility removed, it is well that we would remove that physical barrier in order that we would have nothing which would prevent us from fellowship with that individual. We've seen this lived out practically. You meet someone on the street for the first time, you're not going to say, hey, you want to come over to my house? I'll let you in through my door and maybe I'll give you my keys and, and you can just come and hang out whenever you want. There's not going to be that sort of fellowship between those individuals. But then as you get to know that person, you begin to trust that person, you begin to know who this person is and what their intentions may be, and therefore you may come to a point where you would welcome them into your homes. You would remove that barrier. You may even give them your keys to house sit for you for a little bit of time. That barrier is no longer necessary, and therefore you have removed it. It is necessary for barriers, but it is also necessary that when the time comes that those barriers need to be removed. In the beginning, God, as He created man and woman, Adam and Eve in the garden, He had a, a access, or the people had an access to God which was without barriers except for one. Their access to God was completely unhindered. God walked with them in the garden. They had total fellowship with God. They were completely at one with God who had created them. And they had been given the dominion from God to be able to steward the creation which God Himself had created for Him and uh, for His glory. Well, we know that there was one stipulation that God laid out for the individuals in the garden, that is Adam and Eve. There was one barrier which they could not cross. For if they were to cross it, that would find themselves to be having an immediate death because they had forsaken the command of God to not eat of the tree of the fruit of life in the garden. Well, as we know, they certainly did. Falling under the temptation of sin from Satan, they say, did God really put this barrier up? Did God really say that you cannot have this tree, or this fruit from this tree? And so Eve took and she ate of the fruit and she gave it to her husband Adam and he took and he ate of this fruit. And from that point on, man's relationship to God was completely severed. It was totally severed because in that moment, sin entered the world and our holy God would not and could not be stained by the presence of sinners. Whereas before, the believers had a a, a unequaled access to God where God walked with them in the garden. Now it was that they were no longer going to have that privilege of being able to be united to God in the Garden of Eden. In in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, it says, They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. You see, they recognized that their fellowship with God was severed totally severed. They would not, they could not allow themselves to be in the presence of God, for we know that anyone who is a sinner who enters into the presence of God has an immediate death sentence for them. Man who enters into the presence of the holy God is going to be punished by God because of their sins. And the reality is, is that man immediately from that point forward had a, 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 a hindered relationship with God. There was a barrier always existing between man and God from that point forward. And it's shown in Genesis chapter 3, just shortly after Adam and Eve sinned, we saw that God erected a barrier uh, unlike the one that He said, don't eat of this fruit of the tree of, of knowledge and, and evil. Instead of this, He said, you can't even come into my presence anymore. And He guarded His presence in the Garden of Eden. Uh, in Genesis 3, to 24, it says, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. 
Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned of every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And so it was the case from this, full, this point forward that man in his sinful and wretched condition would not be able to access God in any capacity. They were separated from God because of their sinfulness. God would not be in the presence of sinners, and sinners would not be able to enter into His presence because there was no sacrifice which they could offer that could ever have perfectly removed their sin. You see, the history of Israel denotes to us this fact quite clearly. That even though the Israelites, God's chosen people, were set apart by God to be a holy nation, to be a holy priesthood, separated unto God, unto love and good works, though this was to be the case for the people of Israel, even their access to God because of their sins was hindered. There was a barrier which existed between the Israelites and to God. Not between the pagans and to God, but, but rather the chosen people of God, the very people that God marked out for His own possession, could not enter into His fellowship because they were sinners. The barrier still existed. And this was most wonderfully displayed in the, uh, in the uh, copy of the heavenly places that they were called upon by God to create. In the tabernacle and later on in the temple, we see that there is this picture of man's separateness from God because of their sin. There is this picture which denotes to us in the tabernacle or in the construction of the temple where man cannot enter into the presence of God. There's no way that man can enter into God's presence. You have in the erection of the temple or also in the uh, tabernacle, you have the courts that were there. And in one court, you had the holy place where the priest could enter to offer the sacrifices of the people on. But then beyond that, beyond that, there was a veil. And that veil separated the, most, the holy place from the most holy place where God Himself was going to dwell amongst the people of Israel. And this place was separated by this veil, denoting this fact that there was a barrier which existed between God and man which could not be crossed, lest if they did cross it, they were going to find themselves under God's judgment. They, if they crossed that barrier, they would be having an immediate death sentence upon them. And yet even in this, uh, in this uh, uh, temple worship that they were called on by God to erect through the uh, copy of the heavenly places which God him, wherein God Himself physically dwelt, even though there was this barrier which exists, there was still this glimmer of hope. A shadow is what the author of Hebrews calls it. It was this shadow which pointed to the day where one day, where one day there would be complete and total fellowship returning to God's people where God would dwell amongst His people and His people would be able to dwell amongst them because one day their sins would be forgiven and He would remember their sins no more and therefore their fellowship would return to the sweetness, to the sweetness that once was had in the garden between Adam and Eve and God their Creator. It was on the Day of Atonement where the high priest, the great high priest, was able to enter into the most holy place. He was able to enter into the place where God Himself dwelt and to take the offering for Himself and also for the sins of all of the people of Israel in order that there would be a covering for their sin on that day. And in this picture, it presented this reality that one who was a priest of God, one who had been set apart by God, had been sanctified by God, would enter into His presence and offer up the blood on the cover of the mercy seat in order that there would be this temporary forgiveness of sins which would point to the all-sufficient, total, complete forgiveness that was going to be brought about through the sacrifice of the Messiah when He Himself would come and dwell amongst men and women alike. You see, this picture that was presented on the Day of Atonement sacrifice pointed to the time in which God would remember the sins of His people no longer. And it was not going to be that He would forget the sins of His people through the offering of the blood and bulls, of go bulls and goats. It was not going to be some high priest in which only had a, a human nature that, that, that was also stained and polluted by sin because even this man himself would have to offer up him, his own sacrifices to have his sins forgiven. But rather, God would one day send His Son, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, who would offer up Himself on the cross in order that God would be able to punish sin and sinners once and for all, thereby removing the barrier between God and man in order that we could have complete and total fellowship with Him. You see, the barrier existed for the people of God in all throughout the ages uh, leading up until the Messiah came, Jesus Christ, when He offered up Himself as the atoning sacrifice for sins. That barrier was removed for all who has fa have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
You see, when God sent His Son to the earth, this, uh, this, this moment in time where the Lord Jesus Christ, being God eternal, took on flesh, becoming God incarnate, fully God and fully man, He came and lived this life, lived this life perfectly, subjecting Himself to the will of the Father in order that He would be able to go to the cross willingly, as a willing participant, to substitute Himself in our place in order that the veil which existed between man and God would one day be removed totally and completely through the offering of Himself for the sacrifice of our sins. You see, sin is the barrier which has existed for eternity, which has prevented us from having fellowship with God. Sin is the barrier. God has erected this barrier because of our sinfulness. We cannot approach God in our sin. Yet, when we call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved, our sins are are forgiven and we have unhindered fellowship with God. We can go to His throne room with confidence, with boldness, the author of Hebrews says, knowing the work that Christ has done. You see that the barrier between man and God has been removed is seen both with our eyes and also with ears as we listen to the Scriptures read to us. It is seen in the eyes of individuals who were there on that day when Christ offered up Himself as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the people of God. And in Matthew chapter 27, verse 51, when Christ's sacrifice was finished, it says, And behold, the curtain or the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. That veil which separated the holy place from the most holy place in the temple, when Christ offered up Himself to be the atoning sacrifice for sins, when that sacrifice was complete, that veil was torn in two. This veil was six feet thick in, 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 uh, in diameter. This veil was super, super thick. It was not going to be just some individual just cutting it down in two that would rent the veil in half, but rather God Himself tore the veil in two, showing that access to Him was no longer, was no longer going to be uh, uh, something in which people were going to uh, uh, hope for, but rather they could have it now in its totality through the sacrifice of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22 to 24 says, But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of of Abel. You see, we have fellowship with God those of us who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are reconciled to God. There is nothing hindering our fellowship. We can go to Him day and night, moment by moment, second by second. There is nothing which prevents us from having sweet, sweet fellowship with God, our Savior. We are reconciled unto Him. We must remember this also as we think about this. We have not only been reconciled unto God when Jesus Christ Himself offered up Himself as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Personally, we are reconciled unto God. But when Christ reconciles us unto God through the offering of Himself and by our faith in Him and what He has done, He not only reconciles us to God, but He also reconciles us to all who believe. Meaning that there is no distinction between us now as brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. When we as individuals come by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are personally saved by Jesus Christ. And that is the only way that we can be saved. But the beautiful truth of the Gospel is that not only are we reconciled to God when we come to Christ by grace through faith in His name, but also we are reconciled to those who we at once or who we had previously had hostility with. Not only have we had hostility with God because of our sin, but in our relationships with individuals, those who are of a different culture than us, or those of us who are of a different ethnic background, or male or female, or slave or free, or whatever dynamic you see existing in our world today, all of those barriers, those cultural barriers, those social barriers, those economic barriers, all of those have been torn down through the once and for all sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ because when we are saved by grace through faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ, He unites us to Himself to become one one body, one man in the flesh living as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ who live as equal members of the body of Christ. As we come to Christ, He saves us as individuals and then He unites us together in one body that is His own, whereby we are no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female. Rather, we are one in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 to 14 says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For He Himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in His flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Now notice that not only is our fellowship with God restored through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, but now our fellowship with those who we were once hostile with or towards has now been removed in our being united in Christ. And if we are united in Christ, there must not be any barrier of hostility which exists between us because if we are divided as believers, that means Christ Himself is divided. And we know that Christ is not divided. We know that Christ Himself is not divided from us, and therefore, if we wish to display the perfect unity that we have with our Savior, one thing that we are called to as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ is to live in unity and harmony with one another, to live out the actual state of of perfect unity that we have with our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, through our fellowship with one another as brothers and sisters in His namesake. As we draw back to Acts chapter 21, this is something in which we see here happening in verse 1 to verse 16. You see, as Paul is traveling to Jerusalem, we know that Paul is traveling to Jerusalem to take the money to the Jerusalem saints, which he has collected from the Gentile churches. If you don't know, the Gentiles and the Jews did not get along that well. They really hated each other. They were each seeing individuals as the lesser human. They were saying, oh, I'm not going to hang out with the Jews. I'm not going to hang out with the Gentiles. And Paul said, knowing that Jesus Christ had made us one, whether Jew or Gentile or slave or free or male or female, Paul said a wonderful thing that he could do to bring about the practical unity between these individual believers would be to go to the Gentile churches, which were a little bit well off in in those days, to the Jerusalem churches, which was the generally Jewish church of that day, which was often very poor because of famine and persecution. Paul said, I'm going to take up the offering from the Gentile churches, we're going to go to the Jerusalem church, and we're going to give them money, and this is going to be a, a, a possibility to remove the hostility between these Jewish and Gentile Christians. Now, we'll see how that plays out as we continue in Acts chapter 21, because what I want us to see today from verse 1 to verse 16 is that in Paul's travels to Jerusalem, there was the potential for hostility to exist between him and the believers in whom he was staying with. They were staying with. At every stop, there was this potential for hostility to exist because of what Paul had done prior to his conversion in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, as we come to Acts chapter 21 today, as Paul is returning to Jerusalem, Paul is returning to individuals who not only know who he is, but they know what he had done prior to his conversion in the Lord Jesus Christ. Before this, when he would go on his missionary journeys, the people didn't know who he was. He was just some guy coming to preach a a new message to them, and, and he was planting churches, and that's all they really knew about him. But you see, when Paul goes back to Jerusalem, when he gets back into the land of Israel or Syria, which is to the north, when he gets back to these places, he's not coming to people who don't know him. He's not coming to a place in which he sort of has a, his, uh, his, uh, the history of his life wiped clean, but rather he's coming to a place where people know him and what he did, and this could have led to some potential hostility between Paul and these individual believers. And it has nothing to do with him being a Jew and these churches being Gentile. That's not the case. It has nothing to do with Paul being a male and these churches being female churches. It has nothing to do with Paul being a freed man and him going back to a church where there's a bunch of slaves. It has nothing to do with any of these things. Rather, it has all to do with what Paul had done prior to his conversion on the Damascus Road. It has all to do with the fact that Paul was once a brutal, vicious enemy of these churches wherein he was persecuting these churches even to the death. And now he is returning to these very same places which he once persecuted as no longer an enemy but a friend. And yet even in this, there is still this potential for this wall of hostility to exist between Paul and to these individuals who prior to his conversion, he had such a negative impact on their lives. And so what I want us to see here in order that we would be able to be able to live in a, a pattern of forgiveness towards one another as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ to really work through any hostility that we might have with one another and to engage in fellowship with one another without any hostility between one another. I want us to see this prior hostility that Paul would have had with these individuals, and I want us to then see the present fellowship that they now have together, which alone has been brought about through both Paul and these churches' relationships with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the prior hostility, what is this prior hostility which exists? Let's see it in its totality here. You see, Paul, as he's going here, and we're just going to look at a couple of these verses to see when he stops off in these places. In verse 3, 
It says, When we had come in the sight of Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload its cargo. And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. His first stop was at a place called Tyre. We'll come back to that. But the second stop he goes in verse 8. It says, On the next day we departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. Another stop. One other stop here is in verse 16. It says, And some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing us to the house of Nason of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we should lodge. So Paul stops off at two places. We have both Tyre and also Caesarea. And then when he gets to Jerusalem, he stays with a believer named Nason, who was an early disciple, meaning he was there from the very beginning prior to Paul's conversion. And we're not going to see the hostility here, but if you look through the book of Acts, we know that these churches were not unfamiliar with the work of the Apostle Paul prior to his conversion on the Damascus Road. You say, what did Paul do prior to his conversion on the Damascus Road? Well, in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, Uh, we see how this church got its start. And not only these churches, but also we see how the church in Caesarea and many of the other churches get their start. It says in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, And Saul approved of his execution. Saul is Paul now. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. You flip forward to Acts chapter 11, verse 19, where it says, Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except the Jews. So here you have these different places which I've mentioned, Tyre, Caesarea, and also this man by the name of Nason. You say, how did these churches get their start? What, what, was the re, what was the catalyst which led to these churches being founded outside of Jerusalem? You know, for many, many years, the church just stayed in Jerusalem. They didn't go outside of its walls. They were not going into the ends of the earth as the Lord had called for them to do. What was the catalyst which led to this church in Tyre and this church in Caesarea being started? Well, persecution. When the church found itself being persecuted, it had to flee from Jerusalem in order that it would be able to not only save its life for a time, but also to take up the commission that the Lord Jesus Christ had given to them to be his witnesses and to the ends of the earth. And so we know that this church in Tyre, this church in Caesarea, got its start on an account of the persecution which happened to the believers as they were living in Jerusalem. And you say, what, who was the catalyst behind this persecution? Who is the one that was persecuting all of these churches? Well, Paul. Paul was the one who was the catalyst behind these churches being planted in the region of Tyre and also Caesarea, though not in a positive sense. It was a very negative sense. These churches, these believers were fleeing from Paul prior to his conversion because they knew if they stayed in Jerusalem, the apostle Paul, prior known as Saul, was going to kill them. We read of Paul's persecutions, and I'm just gonna, we're going to flip through Acts to see them. So start in Acts chapter 8, verse 1 to 3. This is the first example of Paul's persecution of the church. It says, And Saul approved of his execution, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Flip forward one chapter to Acts chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Flip forward a couple chapters to Acts chapter 22 to hear Paul's own testimony of what he was doing to the church prior to his conversion. This is in verse 3 to verse 5. I am a Jew, born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God as all of you are this day. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness." From them I received letters to the brothers, and I journeyed toward Damascus to take those also who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. One final testimony of Paul, Acts chapter 26, and then we'll summarize what he's done. Acts chapter 26, verse 9 to 11. He says, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. 
And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities." You say, what was Paul doing before his conversion to the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, let's summarize it. He persecuted the church to the death. He imprisoned both men and women who were believers. He went outside Jerusalem to hunt down believers after they had fled to have them extradited back to Jerusalem to face trial for blasphemy. And if they were convicted, that would mean death. Beyond this, what he would do if he was given the opportunity to vote for the death of a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, he would vote in favor of them being put to death for believing in the Messiah. Beyond this, he would try to make them blaspheme the name of the Lord, meaning to recant their faith in Jesus Christ. And he did all this with raging fury. He was angry doing this. He rejoiced in doing this. He hated the church. He hated Jesus Christ. Paul says of himself, kind of summarizing who he was in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13, though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent opponent. This was the Apostle Paul prior to his conversion on the Damascus Road. He was one who was hostile to both Christ and also to Christ's church. He was one who blasphemed or who spoke with disgust the name of Jesus Christ. He was constantly persecuting the church and Christ himself, as we read prior. And he was also, as he says, an insolent opponent. He was injurious to the church. In other words, he found extraordinary joy in seeing the church of Jesus Christ persecuted to the death. He rejoiced when believers were being killed for professing the name of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. One such example of this is back in Acts chapter 8, verse 1. Acts 8, verse 1, we read of it, Saul approved of his execution. Whose execution? Well, in Acts chapter 7, Stephen, one of the believers, one of the seven disciples uh, who were uh, called to be servants in the church of the church in Jerusalem to help the Hellenists and the Hebrew widows get their fair share, one of these men was preaching the gospel. The Sanhedrin said that he was blaspheming the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They took him outside of the city and they stoned him with stones. And there was Paul approving of, St of Stephen's execution, rejoicing that a believer was being stoned for naming the name as of the Messiah. And now we have some 20 years later in Acts chapter 21, Paul returning to the very same churches which he persecuted to the death. Can you imagine the potential of hostility which could have existed between these individuals' relationships? I mean, could you imagine Paul who once persecuted these churches to the death, who probably killed some of these individuals' friends or was responsible in the casting of his vote for the death of these individuals' friends, now returning to these churches, not as an enemy of Christ, not as an enemy of the gospel, but now as a friend, one who had been saved by the grace of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Could you imagine trying to overcome that hostility? That hostility that might have existed between those who were believers and those who knew of what Paul had prior, do, prior done in, in, his, uh, in his previous life when he was not a believer? One such example Paul writes about in his trying to partner with some churches, uh, Galatians chapter 1, verse 11 to verse 24. It says, For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people, so extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him fifteen days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still a known person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God because of me. You see, Paul, as he was returning to these churches, there was the possibility for some hostility to exist between him and the believers. Though Christ had removed that wall of hostility between him and Paul, meaning God himself had forgiven Paul of what he had done, still there would have been the potential for individuals to hold some grudges against Paul as he was returning to these places. 
I mean, imagine the conversations that might have come up as Paul was in Tyre or as Paul was in Caesarea and, and Paul's, you know, just building some conversation with these individuals, believers there. And he says, you know, how'd you end up coming to this church? You know, what, what got your start here? You know, forgetting what he did. The person said, well, you know, I was kind of running away from you. You were trying to kill me before I was a believer here. Imagine how awkward that could have been for an individual to have this conversation with Paul where Paul is trying to build fellowship with these individuals and all that is in the back of their mind is Paul killed their friend or, or Paul Paul was responsible for their friend being imprisoned or for losing their livelihood. Imagine that hostility which could have existed. There's another example that could have thrown a uh, wrench in Paul's plans in staying with these individuals. When Paul gets to Caesarea, we read of it in Acts 21, verse 8. He says, On the next day we departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. When Paul gets to Caesarea and stays with Philip, it's just noted very nonchalantly here. But if you think back some 20 years, Philip was one who was serving alongside Stephen, one of the seven. Philip and Stephen were both two of the seven, and Saul was approving of Stephen's execution. Now, 20 years later, he's staying at Philip's house, a friend of Stephen, a brother of Stephen, one who Philip probably mourned the passing of Stephen. Now, Philip has invited Paul into his house to say, I want you to stay with me while you are on your journey to Jerusalem to bring the offering to these saints. You see, the very person who Paul watched get stoned to death, and not only watched get stoned to death, but cheered on those who did it, Paul was now staying at his friend's house, and he was in fellowship with him. Church, this is only the work that Christ himself can bring about. That, that this forgiveness and this grace and this mercy and kindness towards those who are showing this positive reception to the Apostle Paul as he returns to these churches some 20 years after he was actively, actively in charge of the persecution of these churches, now they are welcoming him as a treasured, treasured friend. Paul himself could have had so much hostility that he was going to face as he went to these churches. The walls that these churches could have built up to prevent Paul from coming there. You know, Paul, we know what you used to do. We don't really want you here. It's going to be too hard for us. Or, or Paul, you know, you know, you killed our friend Stephen here. And, and even though you're a believer in the Lord, well, why don't you go fellowship with that church down the street? We're not willing to welcome you here. Imagine the hostility and the loneliness that would have resulted in Paul's life as he was seeking to follow the Lord Jesus Christ now as a believer in in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. Imagine the loneliness that Paul would have felt. Imagine the trouble that Paul would have felt as he was rejected by those who were putting up this wall of hostility that was obviously there. It had to be there. You don't just tear that down without having some sort of conversation about it and, and a, a forgiveness and a moving past it. But imagine if they were unwilling to tear down that wall, just as Christ had torn down that wall, what that would have done to their fellowship. We'll see their fellowship in just a moment, but I want to give you some other examples of this. There was a man by the name of Afrikaner. He was a vicious savage who lived during the years of the 1700s. He and his individuals lived in a place in South Africa called Namakwa land, and they were Hottentots by their tribe, by the tribal heritage. Afrikaner was someone that was one who everybody feared. He and his men came along and with hardened, vicious attacks on people, he killed individuals, stole their property, did everything he could to destroy any individual's livelihood. It didn't matter if they were Christian or not Christian, this man was a vicious savage who was seeking to destroy everything in his path. He was so savage that the governor of Cape Town put a price on his head to be given to someone who brought him dead or alive. He and his men were the terror of South Africa until a missionary came by the name of Robert Moffat. And Robert Moffat said that God had called him to the Hottentots and everybody warned him not to go. They said, if you go, Afrikaner is going to use your skull for a drinking cup. Do not go to this man. Do not go to his people. He is going to kill you. This man, Robert Moffat, who was a missionary, said, I am called by God to go to this place and that I will do. Come death, come life, he was going to go. And wouldn't you know it, as he went to these individuals, the first person who was converted was Afrikaner. And Afrikaner went from being an individual who was full of evil and murderous rage, went from one who was like that to now being a follower in the Lord Jesus Christ, who dedicated his life to Jesus Christ and became an effective and useful tool in the advance of the kingdom of God. This was a marvelous miracle of grace. 
And as he, Afrikaner, went about and ministering to the people and to churches which he once probably plundered all of their property, he was welcomed to those churches. As Paul himself was welcomed back to the churches which he had once had victimized and he had once had murdered even some of their family and friends. As Paul himself went, as Afrikaner went, as any individual who was once an unbeliever and has gone into a church as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, as much as there could have been endless barriers which, have, which could have been been put up, they did not allow for those barriers to exist. Rather, they fellowshiped sweetly with one who had been brought from death into life. You see, there was a plethora of reasons why Paul should have not been welcomed by these believers if Paul was who he once was. That is a Christ-hating, Christian-killing menace. But Paul was no longer who he once was. He was now a new believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And because he was a new creation in Christ Jesus who saved him, and because he had been one who was united to Christ through the Spirit of God, these believers, knowing the unity that they had with Paul through Christ, welcomed him into their fellowship. They forgave him of what he had previously done, knowing that Paul himself had repented of his sins and placed his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and they welcomed him as a brother in the Lord, whereby their fellowship was not going to have any barriers, but rather their fellowship was going to be so very sweet. We look at their present fellowship again as we just survey this text from Acts chapter 21, verse 1 to verse 16. In all of these accounts here, we don't see any animosity We don't see any hostility. There's no signs of barriers. There is only fellowship as the people of God here open their hearts and their homes to one who was once their enemy, now having become their friend. You know, this is something you can't even write in the movies. It's so unbelievable. I mean, how could this be? How could it be that someone who once persecuted the church to the death, to the one who once was responsible for these people losing all of their livelihoods in Jerusalem behind and fleeing fleeing, going as far away from Jerusalem as possible in order that they could be protected from this man's murderous rage. How could it be that now there are individuals who are welcoming Paul into their homes and into their family relationships and into their worship times? How could this be? Well, it is only through the work of our Lord Jesus Christ who not only reconciles us to God, but reconciles us to our brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to make this clear here from the get-go. This fellowship between Paul and these believers does not happen apart from the work of Christ. There have been many people who have drifted into universalism or a secular humanism which says, let's just let everybody get along. Let's you know, forget what people have done in the past and, and let's just all get along and sing kumbaya to one another and everything will be well. This was not that. This was rather this realization that if God Himself had forgiven Paul for the atrocities which he had done, for the sinful acts which he had done both against himself and against Christ's church, then who were they to prevent him from coming into fellowship with them? You see, many, as I've said, have drifted into this universalistic idea that they are going to unite to individuals just for the sake of unity, which is really a false unity. There's no common ground. There's nothing that they can unite on. Rather, when we, when we come together as believers in the Lord in fellowship here, we unite on one common ground, on one foundation, and that is that every single one of us who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ are equal members in His body, and therefore our fellowship can be sweet. You see, had Christ never met Paul on the road to Damascus, what we see happening here in these towns where Paul's visiting Tyre and fellowshipping with the husbands and the wives and the children and Caesarea where Philip is welcoming into him in his home and and where Nason in Jerusalem is going to let Paul stay there knowing what's going to happen to Paul as he gets to Jerusalem. None of this, absolutely none of this would have happened if it had not been for Christ uniting Paul to himself. If Paul was not united to Christ, Paul could not have been united to Christ's church. There would not have been any fellowship between Paul and these believers here. But as it was, Paul was united to Christ. These believers were united to Christ. And the unity that Christ brings brings the strongest of bonds and their fellowship that they have during this time was so very sweet. No barriers, no hostility, none of that stuff where it says, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold you to all of these things and then, and then we can be friends. No, no, it was, you're a brother in the Lord, we're brothers in the Lord, we are the family of God, come, dine with us, fellowship with us, we want to be in fellowship with you. The first example we see is in verse 5 and verse 6 when Paul is in Tyre. 
It says, when our days there were ended, he stayed about seven days there, we departed and went on our journey, and they all, with wives and children, accompanied us until we were outside the city. And kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship, and they returned home. I mean, just consider what's happening here, right? 20 years before, Paul was persecuting these people to the death. They were fleeing knowing that Paul had a letter which said that he could take any of them as believers in the Lord, bound back to Jerusalem, that they would stand trial for blasphemy against God and the Judaistic religion if they did not recant their faith. And now, as Paul's going back to Jerusalem himself as a believer, they're not saying, oh, we're glad he's gone. No, they do not want him to leave, and they follow him all the way to the ship Wives, children, husbands, everyone who was a believer there saw Paul off knowing that they were one together in the Lord Jesus Christ. They prayed together. They fellowshiped together knowing that they were one in Jesus Christ. Again, look in verse 12 and verse 13 where we see this example happening in Caesarea. And In Caesarea, we learn that that Paul was told by the prophet Agabus that he was going to be bound when he got to Jerusalem. He says, you're going to go to Jerusalem, and what's going to happen is the Jews are going to uh, bind you up, they're going to imprison you, and they're going to beat you. Well, at the believers' hearing of this in Caesarea, they respond knowing what's going to happen to Paul with this. When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. They were begging Paul, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. We don't want you to have want to what want, want to happen to you what was going to happen to us, which what you were going to do to us some 20 years ago. We don't want that to happen for you. We want you to be protected from that. Paul, don't go to this place. They loved Paul. They cared for Paul because they knew that they were united to their brother. And then in verse 16 with Nason, he going to the house of the one who was living in Jerusalem, an early disciple who knew all of Paul's past. You know, in verse 16, it says, Nason of Cyprus was an early disciple with whom they were going to lodge. This me- being that he was an early disciple, this means that he was there from the very beginning. He, he knew Jesus probably because he was an early disciple of the Lord. And therefore, he not only knew Jesus in his ministry, but he knew Paul's ministry trying to uh, eradicate Jesus and the memory of Christ and what he had done and, and the truthfulness that Christ was still living to this day as he was seated, ascended at the right hand of the Father. This man, Nason, knew that Paul was trying to destroy this, the work of Jesus Christ. And he said, you know what? The Lord has welcomed him. The Lord has forgiven him. Who am I to prevent him from being welcomed to my own home? And they had hospitality together. They were fellowshipping together as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, there is no barrier which should separate us from fellowship with one another if we are in Christ. Not Jew or Gentile, not slave or free, not male or female, not even someone who was once our most hated enemy. If we have been united to Christ, we are united to one another. And if there are barriers between us, this means that Christ is divided. And to that we can say, God forbid. If we are existing with barriers between us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, this is saying that Christ himself is divided. If we are unwilling to reconcile our differences with brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are saying that Christ is divided. You are saying, in effect, by not reconciling with your brother, that you do not see Christ in that person, and therefore you do not want to have fellowship with them, and thereby you are saying, in effect, you do not want to have fellowship with one who is Christ's. You see, if we have been united to Christ, we are united to one another, and there is no barrier which can separate us. The reality is, though, is that we often put up barriers. We often put up obstacles to prevent us from fellowshipping with individuals who have maybe hurt us in the past prior to their conversion. We often are unwilling to reconcile our differences with one another because, well, this barrier that they've put up is just too big and and I'm not willing to tear it down because of what this person just did to me or or what that person just did to me here. They're not willing to to overcome those barriers when the reality is, the reality is, is that Christ has torn down the greatest barrier. And so how much more so then should we tear down any of these lesser barriers? This was an example that Paul was trying to teach to the church at Ephesus when he wrote to them that between Jew and Gentile, Christ had torn down that dividing wall of hostility. See, the reality between the Jew and Gentile was that in the uh, Judaistic worship, this was prior to the believers becoming no longer Jewish in faith, but rather they were becoming Christian in their faith. And not that it's, it's, uh, anyways, we'll move past that. But no longer becoming Jews in their practice, they now became believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and therefore no longer were to boast in their heritage as Jews, but rather to boast in the fact that they were Christ's. 
And therefore, they also were then united to those who, in the Jewish religion, did not worship or fellowship with Gentiles. Paul says, listen, you need to remove that barrier that once existed in Judaism. That barrier's gone in Christ. There's no barrier which exists between Jew and Gentile. There's no Jewish church. There's no Gentile church. There is only one church. And all of those churches are united together, even though they meet in their local settings. All of those churches are united together in Christ. You see, for the Jew, prior to becoming a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, they restricted their fellowship with Gentiles in their worship of God. In this restriction, it's best seen, again, in the temple worship, which I mentioned mentioned just prior. You know, in the temple, you had the most holy place where only the great high priest could go one time a year, and then you had the holy place where only the priest could go to offer up the sacrifices for the people of God. Well, beyond the temple, there were courtyards. And in these courtyards, there were many. The first courtyard was the courtyard of the priests. And this was the courtyard where only the priests could go. Only the priests could go. They would prepare some of the offerings to take into the sacrifice in the the holy place or the most holy place for the great high priest. And they would be there. The priests could be there. But then the next courtyard, which was separated by a little barrier, there was the court of Israel. This was available for any of the men of Israel to enter into. They could go there and they could fellowship with one another there. Well, beyond that barrier was the courtyard of the women. This was a place where only the women could go with the men. The men had to walk through there to get to the next court, but the women could only go here and they could not go any further from that. Well, beyond that, that barrier kind of stopped, and you descend down five steps. This was uh, through uh, historical records. Archaeology has, uh, has looked at the temple and how it was constructed. Beyond this courtyard, which was blocking the temple, there was five steps which you had to walk down, which went down to another flat ground. Well, down 14 more steps from that flat ground was what was called the courtyard of the Gentiles. And this was as far as the Gentiles could come into the worship of the people of God's, uh, uh, the, the people of Israel's worship of God. They could not go past that courtyard. They were separated from being able to worship the one true God because the Jews saw the Gentiles as evil, wicked individuals. They could not go past that. In fact, there is uh, historical records which there were inscriptions written on the wall of the court of the Gentiles which said, if any Gentile goes past this place and into the temple, you are going to be responsible for your death. No Gentile was allowed to go and be a part of the, Gent- uh, the, the, the Jerusalem worship or the Jewish worship unless they converted to Judaism. No Gentile could enter into the worship ser- services of the people of God. And so with that picture, Paul says, listen, those barriers that you guys had erected in the temple worship, those are gone. You know, the Jews said, I'm not going to worship with a Gentile. Paul says, you guys are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. There should not be this barrier between you guys here. Forget about how you once worshiped God. That's gone. There is no barrier between you as Jews and Gentiles or males and females or slaves or free. You're all one in Christ Jesus. So tear down that barrier. Get rid of that barrier. And you say, how could you get rid of that barrier? And obviously the animosity probably was still there. This was years of of hatred towards another individual that somehow or some way is just going to get torn down in one moment's time. How could you do that? Paul says the reason that we can be so quick quick to tear down the barriers that exist between those who are our kindred according to the flesh, the the male or female or slave or free or Jew or Gentile, the reason that we can tear down any barrier is because the greatest barrier has been removed. The greatest barrier being the barrier between man and God. And if God has opened up the barrier for Jew or Gentile to come to Him, for a male or a female to come to Him, or for a slave or a freed man to come to Him, then who are we to put up a barrier between anyone that is unlike us? If they are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, we can be in fellowship with them. Paul goes in Ephesians chapter 2 to say this, and if you want to turn there with me, we're going to read from verse 11 to verse 22. Paul, again, is writing to these Gentiles and these Jews and saying, you guys got to gotta get past these barriers here. You've got to get past these barriers. It says, therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in this flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two, so making peace. 
and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit." Does it seem like there's any barriers left that we should have between one another? Is there any wall of hostility which should exist between us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ? Not at all. We are one, and the Lord Jesus Christ is building us up into a holy temple to be a people of His own possession. Now, let us not imagine this here that this is going to be perfect in our fellowship or in any church fellowship, any local church is not going to have this perfect unity. But what can be said is that any church which does have some sort of barrier between it and another brother, between a brother and sister in the Lord at it, are going to work to tear down that barrier, knowing that they are both one in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is going to be conflict. There are going to be issues. But what we can say quite certainly is that we must be called to work together so that we would always be in harmony with one another. The reality is, is we have been brought into harmony with one another through what Christ has done, and therefore we are to live this out to the best of our abilities by the Spirit's constraining influence in our lives. Where we are convicted of sin, we confess our sins to a brother that we have wronged, and that brother forgives us, or vice versa. Where we maybe have been sinned against by someone, we go to that brother and tell them their fault, and they say, I'm sorry for what I have done to you. You're my brother. You're my sister in the Lord Jesus Christ. We tear down those hostile walls. We tear down that anger that we might have towards someone, knowing that Christ himself has not, had us, not kept us divided from God, but rather he has united us to God, and therefore that barrier which was so large, which he tore down, he can tear down any small barrier which we ourselves might put up. You see, this is what we have been brought into, first for the glory of God and second for the witness to the world, wherein the world can see our fellowship, can see our love, right? The world will know that we are Christians by our love, right? If the world sees that we have barriers, if the world sees that we are unmerciful towards one another, they're going to say, what kind of God do they serve? Surely God has not united them. But you see, when the world sees we are united, when the world sees our mercy towards one another, we can say to them, since we have been united to God, God has united us to one another. Ask us these questions for us to examine ourselves. How quick are we to put up a barrier between other believers because of some minor inconvenience? How often is it that we might leave a church because of disagreement with that direction of that church and never return or contact that church to see how they are doing and never to pray for them ever again, saying, well, I don't go to that church anymore, so what do I care about them, right? You know, that idea, that says, I'm not at that church anymore. Forget about them. I'm, I'm going to care about myself. No, that is showing you're divided from a local church that's a believer, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, right? One other one, how much more often do we harden our hearts towards a believer rather than always being ready to reconcile our differences? I'm reminded here in this passage that in Christ there is nothing which should prevent me from being in fellowship with one who is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. But let me caution us with this. Let me caution us with this. I don't want us to just say, oh, I'm just, you know, I'm one with them, so I'll forget what they did to me here. That is not what I am suggesting here. I am not suggesting that we just overlook sin or that we don't consider sin or that we say, well, you know, our fellowship is stronger than that sin, so I'm not going to worry about that. That's not what is happening here. You see, Paul, as he was received in the fellowship so quickly by these believers here, was not received by them so quickly because they were compromising the truth Not because they said, well, we're just going to forget about what Paul previously did. Not because they wanted to forego bringing up the past hurts, but because Paul had done those things as an unbeliever. You see, had Paul been a believer, there would have been a totally different uh, confrontation between these individuals where they would have called Paul out of his sin and called him to repentance in the Lord in order that their fellowship could again be reunited in the Lord Jesus Christ because Paul himself would have had a barrier he put up between the church because of his sin. But Paul himself says in 1 Timothy 1.13, Though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent, I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. Paul says, God forgave me because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And when I professed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I was forgiven. 
In the same way, the believers could forgive Paul for what he had done to them because he himself had acted ignorantly in unbelief. Paul had already repented of those sins to God, and therefore the believers in those regions could already be able to forgive them. Therefore, they could fellowship with him as they did. See, what I'm not suggesting here is that we overlook the walls of hostility that we have with another believer and just move forward in fellowship with them. Nor am I suggesting that we simply climb over these walls as if nothing happened to us or between us. What I am suggesting is that we work together to break down the walls which divide us in order that we can come to fellowship as we ought, as one body in the Lord Jesus Christ. That if there is a wall which exists between us, some hostility which exists, we don't need to look over it. We don't need to jump over it and say, I'll oh, forget about that wall and I'll just deal with that some other time. No, we will confront it head on because we know that we in, in, uh, in position are one together with that individual and in our practice we wish to see that lived out in our fellowship. Christ has positionally made us one. In our practice, if, this is a, if there is a barrier between us, we will tear down that barrier as we ourselves commit ourselves to working out our differences to the glory of God. I want to give you a scenario here that might happen to us given the uh, climate of our city here. You know, next week we have the Gay Pride Parade happening right here in this city of Hollywood. The celebration of sin and hatred of God will be on full display as thousands upon thousands of individuals come to revel in this thing which they call pride. This thing which they call pride, which they are using in the positive, but rather is quite a negative it is a negative. They are relishing in their pridefulness where they are forgetting God and living out their sinful pattern of lifestyle as they themselves commit themselves to these debauched acts which we know are anti-God just as all sin is anti-God. Say what happens to us next week as we come to fellowship and are believing and worshiping in the Lord Jesus Christ here. Say something happens to us in our fellowship and, and someone from the parade looks down and sees our church here and they say, well, I know what that church believes about the gospel. As we preach and we proclaim sin, and we proclaim repentance, they say, I know what that church does. Say they say, well, we're going to go and mess up this church's worship service here. Say they come in here next week and they just put on a scene in our church and say they just run amok in here and they try to disrupt our fellowship and then they go on and leave and then they go and do whatever it is that they want to do in that parade. But say the following week, one of those people comes back to our church. One of those very same people comes back to our church who prior was a worshiper of themselves and their sinful lifestyle now says, listen, when I came to your church, I heard the gospel. I realized that I have sinned against the holy God and that what I did to you guys that last week was wrong and I'm sorry for doing that. How quickly would we forgive them and remove that wall of hostility and welcome them into our fellowship? See, how quick would we be to forgive that person and not only forgive them, but to welcome them to worship us? You see, if God has forgiven them, who are we? Who are we to keep up a wall? If God has torn down the wall between them and, and Him, who are we to hold up a barrier? You see, church, we must always be ready to reconcile and join in fellowship with believers because if they are not divided from Christ, neither shall they be divided from us. You see, let us be challenged by the example set forth before us today in the life of these believers and their warm reception to the one who was once an evil enemy, but now they welcomed as a treasured friend. I ask us, do we have any hostility between a brother or sister in the Lord here? Have we put up any unnecessary barriers between we, uh, one who we are one in Christ with? Do we have this? If we do, let us seek to reconcile with one another. It's not going to be easy. It's often going to be very difficult and very hard, but it is a worthwhile task. Not only that we would be able to walk here freely and worship God freely here without any animosity between another, but also that we would be able, that we would be able to showcase the mercy of God in our fellowship with one another. You see, I want to encourage you in this work, and while it will not be easy, and you may find it hard to break down that wall that you have with that individual, if you consider the wretchedness of your own sin before God and realize that God was willing to tear down that wall that you had placed between Him and yourself because of your sin, it will be much easier to forgive someone who has wronged you so insignificantly compared to how you have wronged God. And do it with this in mind also, that the fellowship that you have with your brothers and sisters in Christ will show the fellowship that you have with God in Christ. And so think about this for a moment. Are you divided from Christ? No. Will anything separate you from God's love found in Christ Jesus? No. No. 
Therefore, it should not be for us as brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. For if we are one in Christ, we are not divided from one another. If we are one in Christ, there will be nothing that can separate us from God's love found in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, let us recall to our minds as we close in prayer the words of our Lord and Savior that we might apply what we have learned this week. He says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. As Christ has loved us and forgiven us from our sins, even giving up his own life for our sake, that yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let us love our brothers just as Christ has loved us and thereby have a united fellowship which is altogether sweet to the glory of our great God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this wonderful day that we have uh, to consider your word. I just thank you, Lord, for the example that is set before us in the scriptures here today. In Acts chapter 21, God, I I just thank you for how you have just illuminated my own heart as I have studied and and have contemplated these truths here. Lord, I thank you that that even in something which really is just a sub-theme in in my own interpretation of your word has become so magnified in my own heart and, and, and has grieved my heart a bit in where I have failed to reconcile with brothers who I have since uh, passed wrong. And, and uh, Lord, I pray that you would lead me to do that um, even now as I have been seeking out those in my own life who, am I, who I may have some barriers between. God, I pray that you would lead us to be a church that is a church which lives out forgiveness, Lord, and, and not some superficial forgiveness which just says, oh, I'll just forget about it, Lord, but rather a, a forgiveness which says, if Christ has forgiven them, so also can I forgive them. God, help us to grow in Christ's likeness through this passage here today, to forgive those who know not what they do, and to forgive those who are seeking forgiveness from us. God, may we tear down our walls of pride or, or sinful idolatry or, or sinful lack of um, just care or concern for our brothers, and, and may you unite us as one here, Lord, as the body of Christ. Pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.